describing the investigators that were investigating them. Say that again. Stop. Help me. I, every time I read this, I'm like, what the hell's going? They're what? What? So say, help me understand, because this is where I'm like, I'm reading this and I'm like, wait a second. I don't understand what's happening. OK, the whole thing is idiotic. <laughs> Merkel, along with his wife and one other, are alleged to have threatened and or coerced the investigators investigating their actions regarding the investigation of Pam Hunter. If he had a relationship and it was secretive with one of these girls or guy, and that was unknown to somebody else, and that may simply be the defense, which gives him the reason for being there, I believe, as alleged, uh, about, I think the number was 12 times that they said he was there. Hello and welcome to another edition of Here's the Pitch, the law and order version of our podcast. And it's always brought to you by Masses Restaurants in St. Louis, five locations, stlmasses.com. Today, once again, joining us is criminal defense attorney Joel Schwartz in St. Louis. Joel, hello. is that Josh Duham- Dumal? I can't tell. Hold on, let me get my glasses. Yeah, it's really hard to tell, although uh, he's got about six, seven inches on me. <laughs> So, of course, Joel has been on our show, if you uh, join here, and I see a lot of people looked at uh, our podcast. We did two last year on, on Pam Hupp. We did one with Russ, so uh, you can go back and look at those. Uh, you were Russ Freya's defense attorney, uh, for people who have not seen those, uh, on the Pam Hupp case. So if you have some reading you have to do, go back and look at uh, kind of the discussions we had before. But if you're interested in the Pam Hupp discussion, that's what we're going to do here, along with some other Law & Order stuff. You wrote the book, Bone Deep. The untangling the Betsy Faria murder case, and uh, that was came out last year. I know you were promoting that, and it uh, was that a big Christmas seller and still going strong. Yeah, believe it or not, there's still a uh, massive amount of interest in this case. There were some recent developments, and uh, that always renews interest. So the book is still selling well, and the uh, the downloads on the audible on the audible as well as the. Uh, Digital version, they're all going great. Yeah, it's and I read it. It's fun. It's really detailed, and I, it's hard to say it's fun. I mean, we're talking about a murder, but this is a weird case. So let's let's call it what it is. All right, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. It's fun, is what I said about a book about murder. Anyway, um, well, how has has life changed since the show? I know we talked during while it was on on NBC, the truth about or the thing about Pam with Renee, and and of course. Uh, you had a, a starring role in there uh, by 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 proxy, but uh, how did that go afterwards? And, and just sort of the kind of the feedback you got, and just uh, seeing your likeness play out on TV, had, that had to be surreal a little bit, I would think. It is surreal. Um, frankly, it seemed it was more surreal for my friends, and they would tell me, you know, you, you've been dealing with this for so years, so many years. But for us, just to see somebody being called your name, for example, my wife, we'd watch it, and she hear my name on the screen and she would look at me and say this is just so odd so i get that um and it it was a lot of fun that part of it and as far as if my life has changed i guess i'm more recognizable to some people but you know it would air on i think a tuesday night i'd be back at the office wednesday morning bright and early plugging away defending my clients so uh nothing necessarily changed. That's always a fun diversion from your day to day, regardless of what you do. When they make a movie and you are effectively, I suppose, the one of the heroes of the show, it uh, it makes things interesting. I was going to say, any publicity is good publicity, but good publicity is even better publicity. And you look good in the show and you did, uh, you're one of those guys that kind of uh, reversed a decision for Russ and uh, got him out of jail. So there's been some, you know, news in the last couple months. Um, I guess the first one, uh, you know, Pam decides not to have a preliminary trial. Just discuss that with me. Um, You know, what, well, going backwards, her, her public defender dies of a heart attack not trying to joke, though. Did she have anything to do with this? Are we like, anyway? Let's move off that. No, <laughs> you know, what? I, I I had met him before. I didn't know him. He was significantly younger than me, and from what I was told, he was in New York doing depositions on something completely unrelated. Um, and it's really truly sad. Um, this young man with a family had a heart attack and died, and it's just you know, if you want to relate it to this, it. You just don't associate yourself with Pam. Bad things happen. The new public defender that was appointed 
waived the preliminary hearing. And for your listeners who don't know, it is effectively what's termed as a probable cause hearing. The state needs to show that there was at least enough evidence to move forward to set the case for trial. Um, she was going to lose without question. However, as a defense attorney, you can glean a little bit about the way somebody's going to testify, a little bit about what the angle might be on the prosecution side. You may glean what witnesses they may intend to call or they may not intend to call. So it was somewhat telling with no promises in return that she waived this important right. It's very interesting. Yeah, she just does nothing by the book, I guess, is the... She does nothing by the book. I we and I think the last time we talked was before the sixth show aired, and then the the follow up Dateline. Do, how what? How much crime has she created in your mind? Do you think before this this first one that actually got caught? It seems like she was up to a lot of the the Florida angle, and then just sort of all the things that she was doing beforehand. It seems like she did a lot and didn't get caught, right? Am I? Well, here's what I can tell you without any evidence other than what I've read in the report. There was a close friend of hers who drowned in her bathtub in Florida. That is alluded to in the TV series, and everybody was asking me, what is that about? And the allegation was she received money from this friend after this friend died in a suspicious manner. It was ruled accidental based upon the friend's alcohol problem and that there was alcohol in her system when she died. And nobody at that point in time suspected Pam. Hindsight being what it is, I am sure there is some suspicion that has been cast upon her, along with the situation involving her mother, which I think a lot of your listeners know about. However, because it was ruled accidental when it occurred, it's very, very difficult to go back and recreate an investigation when this much time has passed. Yeah. Second uh, bit of new news, uh, this trial moving into a different county. Um, tell me a little bit about that moving, I guess, from kind of the St. Charles area or Troy out to Greene County. Tell me what that means. Whenever a case in Missouri is in a jurisdiction that has less than a certain number of population, a defense counsel can automatically ask for a change of venue. And that was fully expected to happen in this case. The only logical place was, in fact, Springfield. Kansas City, St. Louis are the two, two largest metropolitan areas in the state, while Springfield is a close third. And what you needed was a populace where you can potentially find enough people who haven't heard, not necessarily haven't heard of the case, but at least haven't formed an opinion. So Springfield seemed to make the most sense. There was no way you could conduct this in Troy, given all the publicity that had surrounded the entire case throughout the past 10 years, and given that there was also a, a, a successful lawsuit that cost the county of Troy, or Lincoln County, quite a bit of money. So I think you were going to find a lot of biased people, and Ms. Hupp, regardless of what you think of her at the very least, like any other defendant, she at least deserves a fair trial. Yeah. And then as we watch the series, we watch Dateline, we're like, how is Leah Askey getting away with this? How are the cops? Well, now it seems like we're getting some sort of answers on that, at least Mike Merkel uh, was being followed. Give me some, tell me some, what's going on here. This is kind of the newest news that's come out of this, if you know or can kind of explain. So what's crazy to the first thing you said is Leah Askey, as far as I can tell, has gotten away with the things she did, although she made a laughing stock of herself on that last Dateline episode, thinking she could pull off a slick interview with Keith Morrison. That certainly didn't happen. She looked like, frankly, an idiot. Um, as far as the investigators, Mike Merkel clearly committed perjury in testifying regard about the photographs that he took where the camera malfunctioned and they didn't develop. I caught him in that. There is no two ways about it. Um, he has not been charged with that as most people thought he would. And, and I can't tell you what may or may not happen with that. But his actions and the other actions of the investigators were being investigated by the new consul appointed for, or by Mike Woods, who's a prosecutor, and he had investigators. Well, during the course of the investigation of Merkel, he, along with some, uh, our others, are alleged to have attempted to thwart the investigation by threatening, intimidating, and bribing the investigators that were investigating them. Say that again. Stop. Help me. I, every time I read this, I'm like, what the hell's going? They're 
What? What? So say, help me understand, because this is where I'm like, I'm reading this and I'm like, wait a second, I don't understand what's happening. Okay, the whole thing is idiotic. <laughs> Merkel, along with his wife and one other, are alleged to have threatened and or coerced the investigators investigating their actions regarding the investigation of Pam Hunter. <laughs> Crazy to say, I think I used the term investigation three or four times in one sentence, but that's what it is. Um, so they have now been charged with that crime. And, and what is actually deeper than this is if he thinks he can get away with threatening and coercing the investigators who are investigating him, I have no idea the depths of which he would have sunk to, not just in the Russ Faria case. We know at least somewhat of how depth, deep he went. Um what the depths he went to in these other cases, maybe something simple, maybe when he was on the street, like drug cases, things like that. And how many people's rights that Mike Merkel had violated. I'm sure the list goes on and on and on. And you know what? I guess it's called what goes around comes around. In this particular case, it seems that it's finally come around, at least with him. Yeah. Is there any other people we should be thinking in the back of our head that might be in trouble or do we not want to say their names? I mean, we've got, we got Leah Askey, we've got Merkel, we've named some names there, but other people that you think, Hey, I, I don't like the way this, you know, worked out for us either. Let's talk about them. Well, there were other people involved in the lawsuit that was settled. Um, I can't say that they're being investigated. I can't say they're not being investigated, but the main two besides Leah Askey were uh, Ryan McCarrick along with Patrick Harney. They were both high up in the investigation. They both did things that I didn't feel they should do, that we did actually succeed in the civil lawsuit. As to whether there's criminal liability, that would be a question for somebody else for another day. And what I always hesitate to do, and while I personally disagree with considerable amount of things that they had done, and I think they were not up and on the up and up, um, you learn, you just cast, can't cast aspersions without solid evidence. And my job is not the person to create the, that evidence. Hopefully, Mike Wood will, if there is something there, Mike Wood, I trust, and his investigation team will come up with it, and justice will be served, I hope. This thing doesn't even really probably get going. This trial, what, 2024 now? Is that what we're looking at? And what's the wait? And tell me just kind of the next uh, events. Well, who knows in this case, given Pam Hub, the fact that she waived that preliminary hearing is mind boggling. I still don't know a valid reason why anyone would ever do that in a death penalty case. With that said, there are a number of hoops that have to be jumped through on a death penalty case. And it would not be out of the norm for this case to proceed and go to trial in 2024. And I would love to see it by then. I personally wouldn't be shocked if it even went into 2025. And we're definitely talking jury trial, right? No bench trial or anything like that. <laughs> oh, boy. I can't imagine a bench trial with Pam Hop. The answer, though, is who knows? There is no reason to do a bench trial in this case because what you do have, regardless of all the evidence and regardless of all what we do know about Pam Hop, she was never the focus of the investigation. Had she been, we would not be here today. But you've got a jury of 12 individuals Although they didn't have all a complete picture, they still convicted a man of this crime that Pam Hupp is on trial for, and the state is asking the death penalty. So as a defense counsel, you at the very, very least have that in your pocket. We will keep an eye on it. We'll keep talking to you about it. Bone Deep is the book, so we're kind of looking back at that trial. You wrote about it. You can get the book anywhere. Um, while I have you here, there's obviously another giant news story going on across the country with the Idaho murders. Um, we talked a little bit off off the at the top uh, before the cameras came on. Just your first overall thought on what you've seen here, and I'm going to just kind of pepper you with some questions. Again, you're just watching this probably like everybody else, but I might have some defense questions for you. I, I haven't paid that much attention to it. My first question when they arrested him um, at his home over in the East Coast was, what do they have besides his DNA? Simply put, his DNA could be there at the scene for any number of reasons. It seems that we're finding out now that he was there a significant number of times, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that his DNA was on a knife sheath. Um, without knowing much more, it's hard to anticipate what the state's evidence would be. If he had a relationship and it was secretive with one of these girls 
poor guy. And that was unknown to somebody else. And that may simply be the defense, which gives him the reason for being there, I believe, as alleged uh, about, I think the number was 12 times that they said he was there. The times that he was there were suspicious because apparently it was late at night. And I think um, the cell phone pings that he got and then when his cell phone was turned off the night of the murders makes things incredibly suspicious. His actions after the crime certainly seemed to indicate consciousness of guilt, fleeing the area, selling the car, all those particular things are all things that are going to be used against him. Is it enough to convict him of quadruple homicide? I don't know. My guess is as they dive down deeper into this investigation, there's probably a significant amount that we don't know um, that will come out over time. No cases are alike, but what, what when DNA is involved, and it's involved on the night of a, a how lock tight does that help a case against a defendant? If the DNA shows it, it's, I'm trying to ask you, because I feel like there's, there's been talk about, well, DNA doesn't tell the full story, right? And then everyone wants to say DNA, DNA, DNA. I think people watch the OJ trial and then that, that's what they hear. So tell me a little bit about that. DNA doesn't even come close to telling the full story unless the facts are it's two strangers. If my DNA was in your house and I have no idea where you live and we've never actually met, that's, that may tell the whole story. However, what is my DNA on? If my DNA is on a glove found in your house, well, as they say, I got a lot of explaining to do. But let's say I had these gloves and I had a party two nights ago and then you, something happened to you last night and my gloves are gone. Um, well, that would at least give me an out as to why my gloves were there. You know, you, you use the O.J. Simpson example. Well, the craziest thing, and I remember I was watching it, and it's the criminologist, or it was either him or Mark Furman, took a vial of DNA to the crime scene, and there was a vial of, that, I'm not, of, of blood, not of DNA, and there was a vial of blood that came up missing. That gave the defense attorneys so much to work with and could explain with Mark Furman and his attitude, at least racially, as to how the DNA got on the things they got to. So to say it tells the whole story, it doesn't. Although there are times where a woman, for example, is raped and a man she's never met, never known before from the other side of the city, his DNA is inside her. Well, clearly they had sex. The question is, was it consensual or was it rape? If she's beat up, that combined with the DNA is probably going to tell the whole story. So DNA is a powerful powerful tool that the government uses. The question is, where is it? How did it get there? And why is it there? I have this strange, I don't know why, but I get in these OJ holes and I start watching documentaries. I mean, in your, I don't want to, did he do it? Not whatever. But what, like, what was wrong there? I mean, just all of the things we talked about, just the way that the, I mean, I, I can name a bunch of things. They bring in OJ the day after the murders and they don't really interview him at all. Tom Lang and, and the, they just let him go. Uh, you talked about Mark Furman, how they kind of messed up at the beginning. Like, is it just a complete failure by law enforcement to kind of kind of clean that up before they actually made any arrests? Or what were your thoughts on just that? He had such he had the resources to hire some of the best lawyers in the country who were able to hire the best experts to then pick this case apart. For example, if I've got a vial of DNA missing, I may not never know it. I may not get that information in the discovery because. Frankly, the police may not have turned that over to the prosecutor. I wouldn't know that it existed. I wouldn't know to ask for it. They picked this case apart where they were able to do that. So what you had was, in that case, a racist cop who was on both scenes. You've got a missing vial of blood. And then you've got a very, very popular personality, um, not just in the African-American community, but throughout the country. At that point in time, remember those commercials, Go O.J., and he was a football hero, um, and he was on all those movies. Everybody loved O.J. Um, so you take the combination of those things by giving the defense team, in that case, an out with a vial of blood and Furman's denials that he had used the N-word in the past, you gave the defense team something to utilize to create simply a reasonable doubt combined with the mistake that the state made of agreeing to allow him to try that glove on. That, again, gave them an out. And there's so many reasons why the glove would not fit. All those are irrelevant at this point in time. I mean, I think we all know what really happened, but a reasonable doubt 
is without race based upon reason and common sense. At least that's the tactical technical definition. And reason and common sense seem to dictate what truly happened. But when you give a jury an out and you have a defendant like OJ, I think you're in a position, if you truly want, you can find someone like that not guilty. Yeah, it's an incredible case. We'll talk about it forever. I was actually, my, uh, I have a stepson, he's 14, and we, me and my wife were trying to decide, okay, well, if this happened today, what black prominent, because OJ, like you said, commercials and TV and we came up with Michael Strahan. If this happened to Michael Strahan, it would be that's what it would be. We can't, you know, we could name a few na- names, but on Good Morning America, people love him. You know, that's how what OJ was. You know, it, it, happy, bo- bo- you know, a bombastic, happy guy. You know, I don't even know if he's anywhere near as popular as OJ was. I think your best example though was Bill Cosby. Yeah, yeah. Everybody loved uh, Mr. Huxtable. <laughs> he was a comedian. He did Jello commercials. Um, he was to me at the time at least, probably more popular and likable than OJ. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, also in jail, or should be, uh, according to the evidence. Anyway, um, back to the Idaho thing. I don't even know if this has been brought up, but I've just had a curious question for you. How, how easy and quickly can someone uh, claim insanity? Let's say our, our killer, our alleged killer here in Idaho uh, says, uh, well, I'm pleading insanity. What, what are, how hard is it to do that? Tell me a little bit about just if, if he did go that route or w- how hard it is to actually do that. It's very, very difficult. Um, and then it's very difficult to win. You would, you can claim it if you have previous psychiatric issues, been hospitalized, things like that. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're not guilty by reason of insanity, but that would, that would be a nice start to that claim. But what you have to have is Number one, the inability to understand right from wrong, and then the inability to control your actions. Well, you can use so many things, especially in someone like this life. I believe he was a graduate student in criminology, something along those lines. There's got to be so many examples where he knew right from wrong. You're also going to have psychiatrists examine him and to try to determine if he's acting, if he's malingering, meaning he's faking it, um, or he actually can't assist in his defense, which is the other part of it, or he doesn't know right from wrong. I simply don't think that's going to be something that this person can rely on. It may be something that they attempt to rely on. I would argue in the Pam Hupp case that they probably will at least attempt that and probably have had psychiatrists visit her and talk to her. But given her actions, she's just not going to fit that. Somebody attempts to cover up a crime knows that it's wrong, and knows what they're doing. To redirect this, there was a case that I was involved in peripherally where a woman shot her husband as he got off a plane in plain view of witnesses in front of a private investigator that she had hired because she thought he was going to kill her. Every psychiatrist we had examined the woman said she was suffering from all sorts of different psychiatric diseases. She did it in front of witnesses. There was no cover up. She hired actually one of the witnesses, albeit unwittingly that she was going to do it at the time, but she simply was unfit to proceed to trial. Yeah. Um, you know, and we're just watching this Idaho case, just uh, <laughs> like everybody on TV, but it, it, we know his criminology background and he's did all these papers. And do, do you think just spitball in here, me and you, do you think his goal was to get away with murder? Just, for kicks to see, to work on his research, just that odd of a mind? Well, I can't answer that. Um, It seems to be that's the way that the news cycle is trying to portray it. And that certainly may be the case. And that means he's messed up in the head. That's where I was going with insanity, right? So that doesn't make make insanity. Right. Yeah. That just, just being, having, Being a bad person and wanting to kill somebody does not make you not not responsible for your actions. One last thing on that, maybe a couple more, but he asked when the police arrested him, did you arrest anyone else? What does that mean to you when you you hear uh, someone, maybe a client, uh, you hear this on the news media, that someone seemingly coached or just who knows? But what do you think of when you hear him saying that, asking that question as he's being arrested? Interesting. Um, The only thing I can interpret by that is I would say I would if I'm on law enforcement side, I would think that's a bit of an admission of guilt. And the admission is, okay. there was somebody else involved with me. Yeah. 
It's very weird. Interesting case. I guess there'll be some more news coming out throughout the year with that. Um, Joel, that's all I had for you. Bone Deep is the book. You're a criminal de de attorney, defense attorney here in St. Louis. Uh, anything you want to say? Anything that we may have missed in our conversation here? All I can tell you is if you want to have me back on again, it's a pleasure being here. I enjoy these conversations. And just let me know. And if anybody is interested, um, you called the book fun. It's not fun, but everyone who's read it, they, they will tell me it reads like fiction. And the part of it that, that's quote unquote fun is it's crazy because it's all true. People get very frustrated. They want to throw the book against the wall once they realize this is all firsthand account and is all accurate and true. Um, so that's the part that keeps people reading. I hope it's also entertaining as well. So I appreciate you having me um, and I look forward to seeing you again and come back anytime. Come back anytime. Yeah, we'll call the book Interesting and Entertaining. I'm going to do that. <laughs> uh, okay. All thank right. you, Brad. That's Joel Schwartz. I thank him for joining me. I thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.